very pleased to welcome all of you to the Spring Judeo-Christian Studies Lecture. I'm Rana Berger, I'm in the philosophy department, and I am uh, the Geisman Chair responsible for directing this series, this lecture series. Tonight we have the Hugh McCloskey Evans Memorial Lecture, and it's provided us an opportunity to bring to campus Thomas Hibbs, we'll welcome in a moment, who is a distinguished professor of ethics and culture and dean of the Honors College at Baylor University. Professor Hibbs received his BA as well as master's degree from the University of Dallas and his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He taught in the Great Books Program at Thomas Aquinas College and later in the philosophy department at Boston College before taking over the dean's position at Baylor in 2003. I knew of of Professor Hibbs' important work in medieval philosophy, as well as contemporary virtue ethics. I was especially attracted to his book on Aquinas, Virtue's Splendor, Wisdom, Prudence, and the Human Good. In part, I'll admit, because the title sounded exactly the same as the papers and books I've written on Aristotle, on Aristotle's ethics. In fact, though, it's really quite exciting to see, with Professor Hibbs' guidance, how the Aristotelian question of the good life, and in particular the relation between action and contemplation, takes a distinctive shape in the thought of Aquinas. I hope I'm going to you've inspired me to pursue that further. What took me a little by surprise, though, although it now makes perfect sense to me, was discovering Tom Hibbs' recent film criticism and his writing on film noir and on nihilism in contemporary culture. A reader of one of his books, Shows About Nothing, remarks that he would never have believed an insightful discussion of subtle relationships between nihilism, romanticism, and liberal individualism could be so hard to put down. The book, he says, is a profound page turner. In another book, Arts of Darkness, Tom Hibbs uncovers behind the bleak world of film noir, characters engaged in some sort of quest for redemption. One comment on the book points in the direction of our lecture tonight. Noir arises from the same impulses that prompted Pascal to write of the hiddenness of God. This afternoon, another confession, when I should have been working on the fall schedule, <laughs> I found myself immersed in Tom Hibbs' film reviews, provoked to think about a movie like, for, exam, for instance, Dark Knight Rises, as a story, in his words, that ends by affirming the nobility of the deepest desires of the human heart. On his Baylor website, I read, I don't know if this is from you, Tom, Dean Hibbs' lectures have been protested by nihilists at Boston University and communists in Sicily, so on. I don't expect that we will match those accomplishments, but I'm sure some of you will have good questions after the talk, and I know we are all very fortunate for the opportunity to hear Thomas Hibbs' thoughts this evening on divine irony, Pascal on faith and reason. Thank you, please welcome Professor. <laughs> Thank you very much for that generous and entertaining introduction uh, and, uh, and for the gracious invitation. It's really an honor to be uh, speaking in this series and to be with you here. The, um, the nihilists at Boston University, that's when I was teaching at Boston College and I had written this book on nihilism and popular culture. And when the talk was announced, the, the nihilist group at BU put up signs across campus protesting that I was coming to talk about nihilism. I thought the, the idea of nihilist protesting was, uh, was interesting. <laughs> but more, more in keeping with their ethos, they didn't show up for the lecture. Uh, and the, uh, the lecture at Sicily, uh, I had a friend over there who had, uh, this was a good number of years ago when the EU still had money, and he got some sort of EU grant and there was this big conference on Europe and the future of happiness was the title. They weren't 
protesting my lecture in particular, but they were out in the square just outside where we were meeting, chanting, no future happiness, happiness now. So I thought that maybe the, the, my show's about nothing book, that could have been a Seinfeld episode. Um, at any rate, so I'm delighted to be here with you, uh, with you tonight and uh, to talk about Pascal. Um, this is the, the sort of core of a book I'm writing, trying to finish on Pascal. And uh, so uh, I'm happy to, to deliver this and then engage with you. I've still got time for you to correct my errors and for me to correct my own before I submit the book for publication. So, uh, Pascal writes at one point, philosophers startle ordinary people, Christians astonish the philosophers. With its allusion to both Socrates and St. Paul, Pascal's pithy aphorism contains, I argue, the key to understanding his conception of philosophy and its relationship to divine revelation. Revelation's mode of pedagogy, its mode of teaching, is ironic. Disrupting the ordinary and expected flow of events, it occasions surprise. Irony, in any case, seizes upon incongruity upon the gap between what we think we know and what we actually know, between what we anticipate and what actually comes to be, and between what we think we are and what we in fact are. To ordinary human beings, the philosopher who rejects what the many esteem in favor of some other less apparent good seems at best comical and at worst threatening. Similarly, the Christian life has seemed absurd or hazardous both to conventional life and to the life of philosophy. Thus, Paul speaks of the cross of Christ as folly. In Pascal, as in Paul, the praise of folly is ironic. It is not the result of a crude anti-intellectualism. Rather, it rests upon a recognition of human beings' ignorance of an unseen or unexpected order. Irony does not, in this case, confine the intellect, but hopes to awaken it, insofar as it is capable of grasping the irony to an insight into liberating depth. The order or plane of knowledge on which an individual operates determines what he or she sees or fails to see in other orders or planes of knowledge. Now interpreting Pascal from the perspective of ironic teaching has certain advantages. The chief of which I would suggest is, it, is that it uh, shows us a way to seeing how his writings contain a much richer conception of the relationship between faith and reason than what interpreters typically recognize. Highlighting the role of irony in Pascal brings to the fore a significant and enduring analogy between reason and revelation as Pascal sees them. It also helps us to see the various and apparently fragmented themes of Pascal's great unfinished work, the Pensee, in a unified way. As Charles Griswold suggests in an essay on irony in the Platonic Dialogues, the concealment and enigmas associated with irony can have either of two functions, maybe more than two, but he points out these two important possible functions. The point might be that within every philosophical position, there's a puzzle within which there awaits a riddle, one that in turn conceals an enigma, and so forth ad infinitum. The implication would be that the universe is intrinsically unknowable. But there's another possibility, Griswold suggests. The function of irony in the dialogues might be to encourage us to become philosophical by rightly appropriating for ourselves the dialogic search for knowledge, a search focused on a multifaceted question. What is the good life for a human being? On this interpretation, irony mirrors not the absurdity of the universe, but the limitations of the human ability to understand. The latter, I would suggest, befits Pascal's use of irony. Now, in our current culture, from the sophisticated to the crass, skeptical and even nihilistic versions of irony abound. The most influential philosophical defender of this sort of irony, as a mood or posture befitting our age, is the philosopher Richard Rorty, who writes, at one point, we felt a need to worship something which lay beyond the visible world. And now we have arrived at the point where we no longer worship anything, where we treat nothing as a quasi-divinity. 
where we treat everything, our language, our conscience, our community, as a product of time and chance. The result for Rorty is, or should be, ironic detachment from what he calls our final vocabulary, the language we use to talk about our ultimate aims and fundamental commitments. For Rorty, encountering rival vocabularies and alternative systems of belief engenders radical and continuing doubts about one's own final vocabulary, and thus it inculcates in us a posture of irony. Pascal's account of irony is closer to Griswold's than it is to Rorty's, and the link Griswold detects between irony and the question of the good life informs Pascal's thought as well. His apology, the pensée, has less in common with modern apologetics in either its rationalist or fideous forms, and more in common with Socrates' own apology, understood as a defense of a way of life. Pascal, in this way, makes a distinctive contribution to the very old debate over the best way of life. For example, the wager argument, the only argument in Pascal that receives regular treatment from philosophers, is best read not as an isolated piece of reasoning, but as one moment within a comprehensive defense of the Christian way of life. Thus, this argument, the wager, which is an invitation to a specific type of interlocutor to adopt the Christian way of life, can only be properly understood as part of the larger whole of Pascal's account of the human condition and the relationship of faith and reason. Reading Pascal in terms of this great debate about the best way of life also sheds new light on his debates with two of his French contemporaries, Montaigne and Descartes. Pascal reads Montaigne and Descartes as offering in quite divergent ways defenses of the sufficiency of the philosophical life seeing the three of them as engaged in a common debate allows us to see these three accounts as conflicts over the best way of life. And it allows us to recover a sense of the connections among philosophy, science, and ethics in the early modern period. And this question of the best way of life is inescapable for all three of these early modern French thinkers from the question of who teaches authoritatively concerning that life. And that is a question ultimately of whether reason or faith is the supreme authority on the good life. Leo Strauss puts this point succinctly at one point in his own writings. Man cannot live without light, guidance, knowledge. Only through knowledge of the good can he find the good that he needs. The fundamental question, therefore, is whether man can acquire that knowledge of the good, whether men can acquire that knowledge of the good, without which they cannot guide their lives individually or collectively by the unaided efforts of their natural powers, or whether they are dependent for that knowledge on divine revelation. No alternative is more fundamental than this, human guidance or divine guidance. This question surfaces repeatedly in Pascal's apology. One of the many paradoxes concerning Pascal's disposition toward philosophy can be seen in the very formulation of this central question, a question to which, for Pascal, the only adequate answer is theological. Yet if Pascal's answer is theological, his manner of framing the question is decidedly philosophical. As noted in that opening question, that opening quotation about philosophers surprising ordinary people, Christians surprising the philosopher, Pascal has in mind three ways or levels of life. The ordinary life, that of the philosopher, and that of the believer. In a related passage, he describes three orders of things, flesh, spirit, and will. The carnal, he says, are the rich and kings. They have the body as their object. Inquirers and scientists, they have the mind as their object. The wise have righteousness as their object. As one commentator puts it, Pascal conceives of the three orders, not only as orders of being, but also as moral categories in which individuals range themselves according to the nature of the end which they pursue as the goal of existence. That activities and ways of life are ordered to ends is integral to Pascal's account of the human condition. It is also the basis upon which he engages both ordinary folks and philosophers. The wager, to return to that well-known argument again, presupposes that happiness and truth are naturally recognized as goods. At one crucial point in the wager, Pascal says, you have two things to gain, 
truth and happiness, two things to lose, right? Un or two other things that would be the loss of those, unhappiness and falsity. So Pascal embraces the dominant pre-modern affirmation of a u universal human desire for happiness. He writes at one point, sounding like Aristotle or Augustine or Aquinas in this, all seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. That is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Among the many false and imperfect ends pursued by human beings, there is within and beneath them all a longing for the true good and final end. Now, like other moderns, say Hobbes, he repudiates the classical Aristotelian notion of purposiveness in nature. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he retains the notion that human desire has a certain telos or goal, the desire for happiness. Pascal's supple understanding of philosophy has been mostly neglected in contemporary accounts, in part because this teleological language has been overlooked, and in part because the centrality to his project of the Socratic question has been ignored. Before Pascal, Montaigne and Descartes invoke Socrates as they take aim at the pretenders to the name of philosophy. In castigating the professional philosophers of their time, they present Socrates as a counterexample. The difference between the two approaches to Socrates is that Montaigne thinks of Socrates as an insuperable exemplar, while Descartes treats him as the figure to be surpassed. Yet both are doing something new with Socrates. Montaigne praises Socrates for his union of contemplation and action, his unending quest for self-knowledge, his ability to move from one human occupation to the next as if they all equally befit him. The problem as Montaigne sees it is that after Socrates, philosophers try to advance beyond his learned ignorance. They attempt to solve the problems of philosophy, to answer the highest questions, and thus they expose philosophy as a failed project. But this is only because the original Socratic self-understanding has been lost. Still, Montaigne's Socrates is something of a fictional construct. As one commentator, Eudra Friedrich, puts it, in his description of Socrates, Montaigne is often describing himself. Montaigne does not go beyond Socrates in the sense of trying to complete or transcend him, but he does differ from Socrates. He has no interest in the speculative elements of the dialogues, the metaphysical and epistemological investigations of the good or of recollection. Even more strikingly, philosophy is no longer practiced in terms of a dialectical investigation of received opinions and the quest for truth that is the initial and abiding motivation for that inquiry. Most notably, Montaigne purges Socrates of any residue of the erotic longing for wholeness or transcendence. If the prominence of Socrates in Montaigne's writings is apparent, and with each different edition of the essays, the, the references to Socrates proliferate. If it's apparent in Montaigne, his significance for Descartes is hardly clear at all. Yet, in his brief discussion of the history of philosophy in the preface to the principles, Descartes set Socrates and Plato on one side because they recognized their, their ignorance, and the rest of the history of philosophy on the other side because they don't recognize it. However, unlike in Montaigne, here the return to Socrates is insufficient. Descartes wants not the love of wisdom, but its possession. The recovery of Socrates in Descartes is but a prelude to the surpassing of Socrates. In another passage in the Discourse on Method, when Descartes is concluding a summary of what his education gave him, I came to think I had gained nothing from my attempts to become educated, but increasing recognition of my own ignorance. Of course, this is the Socratic insight the one beyond which Socrates was unable to move. Descartes moves very quickly beyond this insight, and he presents it as if it is something to be utterly 
regret it. It's the failure of his education to lead him to the recognition of his own ignorance and nothing more than that. Even more interestingly, in the opening discussion in the Passions of the Soul, where Descartes counsels against excessive wonder, the vice he calls astonishment, which he describes as a rapture of the soul in which the whole body remains as immobile as a statue. We have passages in the dialogues where Socrates is described in virtually those exact terms, suggesting, perhaps, that Socrates himself is the principal example of the vice of astonishment. Now, in Pascal's writings, important Socratic themes also surface. In a telling autobiographical remark about his conversion from physical science to the study of human things, Pascal mimics Socrates' own conversion. Pascal writes, I spent a long time studying the abstract sciences, and I was put off by them, seeing how little one could communicate about them. When I began the study of man, I saw that these abstract sciences are not proper to man, and that I was straying further from my true condition by going to, into them than were others by being ignorant of them. I thought I should find many companions in my study of man. Since it is his true and proper study, I was wrong. Even fewer people study man than mathematics. It is only because they do not know how to study man that people look in to all the rest. Philosophy, which is about matters nearest and most significant to us, indeed about our very selves, is surprisingly the least pursued. If Pascal embraces Socrates' sense of the source and subject matter of philosophy, he also affirms Socrates' insistence that philosophy is about an ever-increasing awareness of the limits to human knowledge. Echoing Socrates, he writes, knowledge has two ends that meet. One is the pure and natural ignorance of every man at birth. The other is the extreme reached by great minds who run through the whole range of human knowledge only to find that they know nothing and come back to the same ignorance from which they set out. But it is a wise ignorance which knows itself. The paradoxical note here in Pascal's comment about ignorance and wisdom signals not so much a repudiation of reason as a deepening of self-knowledge. The passages in Pascal most critical of reason are all intended to foster in readers a sense of their own wretchedness. But wretchedness, as Pascal repeatedly insists, is itself explicable only based upon the concomitant apprehension of greatness, the sense that something has been lost or is disordered or is lacking that ought to be there. All our dignity, Pascal writes at one point, consists in thought. We must strive to think well. That is the basic principle of morality. Indeed, in one of the longest fragments in the Pensee, entitled Against Indifference, Pascal urges upon every human being the task of seeking for knowledge concerning his nature, condition, and ultimate destiny. Pascal bases this argument on assumptions concerning human dignity and self-interest. Indeed, he goes out of his way to insist that the shape of human life as a quest is evident not from principles of piety, but from ordinary human reason. To see this, he says, we need only see what the least enlightened see or should see. Philosophy for Pascal would seem to function as a salutary corrective to the forgetful way in which most human beings pass their lives. It raises in a serious way questions about serious matters and initiates the search for answers. In this respect, Pascal might be said to restore to philosophy the central role of erotic longing for wisdom and happiness, both of which seem to exceed its grasp. Yet the restoration involves a reassessment, the claim that the difficulties about discovering the good and the true is not contemplated with detached pleasure for Pascal, but with growing unease, with the painful realization that the deepest longings of the heart appear subject to violent and tragic frustration. Philosophy functions as a sort of protreptic for Pascal, yet when it goes beyond this initiation and delivers answers, it seems to exceed its capacity even if the pursuit of truth is its very telos, or goal. In this, Pascal departs not only with Descartes, 
but also with Montaigne, who supposes that the cultivation of Socratic ignorance is sufficient. For Pascal, what Montaigne does curtails the natural telos of philosophy, its orientation toward truth, wisdom, happiness. Such a telos remains unrealized in the discursive activity of questioning. The very activity for Pascal, and here he echoes uh, an argument from one of Augustine's early uh, Kasekiakim dialogues, the very activity of inquiry becomes distorted if its goal-directed character is replaced with the counsel to be content with the questions themselves. Now, Pascal's attacks on Descartes aim simultaneously to restore Socratic ignorance and to exacerbate the sense that philosophy itself is forlorn, bereft of the hope for the very thing it most desires. In face of an incomprehensible natural order, of lingering doubts about human knowledge, and of the mysteries of soul and body, Pascal leads the would-be Cartesian to an experience not of calming certitude, but of baffling wonder. So, for instance, in one of the most important uh, and longest uh, sections in the Pensee on the disproportion of man, Pascal takes up this theme central to Descartes of the infinite and begins a meditation on the infinitely large and the infinitely small, which ends with a sense of our own ignorance of our place, our inability to fathom by imagination or thought, either the infinitely large or the infinitely small. Thus does mathematics in Pascal's hands undergo a kind of re ironic reversal of what happens in Descartes, whereas mathematics provides in Descartes the model for certitude, for a method that's going to help us to eliminate all difficulties. In Pascal, the very focus on mathematics leads us to paradoxes that stun us and leave us baffled. So mathematics doesn't eliminate wonder, it exacerbates it for Pascal. The greatest mystery, the most baffling object of inquiry is, of course, the human person. What sort of freak is man, Pascal writes, judge of all things, feeble earthworm, repository of truth, sink of doubt and error, glory and refuse of the universe, man infinitely transcends man. Sounds a little bit like one of Hamlet's uh, soliloquies there. After listing the inexplicable contradictions in the human conditions, Pascal states, I go on contradicting him until he sees that he is a monster that passes all understanding. Astonishment for Pascal is not a vice, as it is in Descartes. It marks the peak experience of philosophy. An ironic pedagogy is designed to force upon the interlocutor Pascal imagines a multiplicity of interlocutors for the pensée. It's to force upon each one of them a self-awareness that the interlocutor would otherwise lack, an awareness of one's own ignorance, of where one stands with regard to the pursuit of truth, of whether and what, to what extent one is equipped even to begin successfully a pursuit of truth. Instead of marching forward, confidence in one's own understanding and one's capacity, irony counsels a retreat to discern whether one is equipped to begin the search and how the search should be effectively pursued. A few words about divine irony. Commentators of Plato have noted that concealment is an essential component in irony. As Alexander Nehemas in particular has argued, concealment can constitute a path intermediate between lying and truthfulness. It could be lying but it could also constitute a path between lying and truthfulness. It shares features with both. Like truthfulness, concealment does not, or does not necessarily, I would add to Nehemiah's, distort the truth. Like lying, it does not reveal it. This fits Pascal's account of divine irony. As he repeatedly insists, God is hidden. Pascal speaks of the boldness of those who attempt to appeal to nature, in an effort to move unbelievers from doubt to belief. Pascal prefers the language of scripture, which states that God is a hidden God. Concerning the incarnation itself, about which Pascal believed the second person of the Trinity manifests himself in human flesh, Pascal says about the incarnation, it was not right that Christ should appear in a manner manifestly divine, 
and absolutely capable of convincing all men. But neither was it right that his coming should be so hidden that he could not be recognized by those who sincerely sought him. As one of the great commentators on Pascal writes, uh, Jean Menard writes, God dissimulated his divinity under a veil in the Incarnation. And the Incarnation is perhaps the chief example of the irony that characterizes divine pedagogy. As we look up to the heavens or philosophically contemplate the attributes of a transcendent being, God appears in our midst as an individual human being, born at a particular time and place, in a little known part of the world, occupies no public office, and leaves no writings behind. The scandal of particularity is a surprise and an affront to the philosophical approach to God. It is the method of divine irony. And the recognition for Pascal of God as a mediator presupposes certain dispositions on the part of the agent, an acknowledgement of our own wretchedness and need for grace. In the fallen state, according to Pascal, we vacillate between pride or presumption and despair. There's actually, a, in, in Pascal, I think, this notion of the vacillation between presumption and despair, I think he sees this in philosophy itself. For example, I think he would suggest that Descartes philosophy is an example of presumption and Montaigne's is an example of despair and and I think Pascal would read modern philosophy uh, going forward from Descartes as a series of alternations back and forth between presumptuous attempts to perform and complete the transcendental deduction and deconstruction saying there's nothing we can know that's it's, it's worth thinking about a kind of Pascalian account of the history of philosophy especially of modern philosophy. But what he's talking about here is each of us in the human condition. We vacillate between presumption and despair. Knowing God merely as God and not as Redeemer, according to Pascal, exacerbates the condition. It engenders the proud assumption that we have attained God by our own powers. True knowledge of God for Pascal is inseparable from self-knowledge, a recognition of our wretchedness. Yet true knowledge must not leave us despairing over our condition. It offers the hope of a cure. Not knowing our own wretchedness makes for pride. Knowing our own wretchedness without knowing God makes for despair. For Pascal, knowing Christ strikes the balance because he shows us both God and our wretchedness. The religion of a humiliated, crucified God, inconceivable to natural reason, for Pascal explains the paradoxes of human nature. As Pascal writes of figurative statements in the Hebrew scriptures and in the, uh, in the Christian scriptures as well, a figure includes absence and presence. But once the secret to the deciphering of the figure is revealed, it's impossible not to see it. Irony, in fact, is even woven into Pascal's teaching on the three orders, which I've already mentioned, body, mind, and spirit. These orders are different in kind and incommensurable. The lower, unlike other hierarchies historically, where you move from the lower up to the higher. Consider Plato's divided line as an example of this, where grasping the image as an image moves you up. For Pascal, these three orders are incommensurable, and you can't get to the higher by reasoning from below. The lower knows nothing of the higher and provides no access to it. The greatness of intellectual people is not visible to kings, rich men, captains, who are all great in a carnal sense. The greatness of wisdom, which is nothing if it does not come from God, is not visible to either carnal or intellectual people. Here, there emerges a hierarchy of wonder or bafflement, of wisdom mistaken for folly. So, and I think this, these three orders, again, that opening aphorism, that philosophers surprise ordinary people, Christians surprise the philosophers, from whatever level you're on, looking up at the higher level, it's baffling and inconceivable to you. The irony of the philosopher in relation to the rest of humanity is redoubled in the irony God exhibits toward the philosopher. The lowliness of the philosopher exemplifies in Socrates' uncomely physical appearance, his lack of public office, wealth, and political honor. All this renders him, at best, a comic absurdity to the common citizen. Of course, when he proceeds to unveil the superficial trappings of the life of those deemed honorable by the standards of society, he's no longer laughable but threatening. Similarly, God's revealing of the life of wisdom to the lowly, 
to the foolish of this world, to carpenters, startles both those deemed honorable by worldly criteria and the philosophers themselves. The philosopher, confident in his own way of life, is apt for Pascal to be deceived by appearances. He is likely to equate the Christian religion with sub or pre or merely proto-rational myths of classical paganism. In the case of Christianity for Pascal, what seems lower is in fact higher. There's comic reversal here. Such a reversal of expectation, an ironic reversal, is evident in Pascal's discussion of original sin, which Pascal thinks explains the paradoxical duality of wretchedness and greatness in the human condition. Pascal comments, God hid the, the knot, K-N-O-T, so high, or more precisely so low, that we were quite unable to reach it. Pascal seeks, in his ironic pedagogy, not just to surprise and contradict the philosopher, but he seeks something that the philosopher also seeks. He seeks the intelligibility of the whole, an intelligibility he thinks that's made manifest only retrospectively and from the vantage point of the Christian hypothesis. There, there's some nice work on Pascal's apologetics in relation to his mathematics. He did very interesting and novel work on projective geometry and the conic sections. And unlike ancient Greek generations of the conics, conic sections where they're all generated individually, Pascal has one sort of account that generates all of the conic sections. It's, it's like taking your lampshade at night in a, in a fairly dark room, except you have the light on the lampshade and you move it and you go, you, you can sort of generate from a circle all the different conic sections in that way. And Pascal has this, this notion of wanting to understand variegated phenomena from the perspective of one central source. That's the method that he's using in his own apology, in his own attempt to understand the whole. Of course, none of this constitutes a philosophical demonstration of the truth of the Christian faith. Indeed, the very claim to offer such a truth would be to deny the very nature of faith, which are the result of an unmerited gift. Irony for Pascal thus plays a central role in safeguarding the revealed character of the comprehensive truth about the human condition. Yet the Christian faith does not evaporate in the face of or retreat from rational debate. Now the proper pedagogical use of irony, and this is uh, moving toward the conclusion here, is a matter of deft rhetorical skill and prudential assessment. It's interesting that the famous wager argument, it's not often noted, is in fact a dialogue between a convert and some, a would-be convert who's equally reluctant to make the move. It's a dialogue, and it's tailored explicitly to that particular soul. Irony, too, the irony of the teacher, involves prudential assessment of the types of character in the audience. It's most fruitfully exhibited in the dialogue of two or three interlocutors, where the needs and capacities of each soul can be detected in the concrete flow of the conversation. It is thus a highly personal mode of communication, one that cannot be reduced to abstract principles or to a written text. For Pascal, I would suggest, although Christian revelation certainly takes shape in authoritative texts and doctrinal pronouncements, revelation is primarily from, about, and to persons. The exclusion of such a personal God active in history is the target of Pascal's most vociferous attacks on Descartes. He writes at one point, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God, but he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. After that, he had no more use for God. Pascal aligns Descartes' idea of divinity with deism, which according to Pascal is as almost distant from Christianity as is atheism, because neither conceives of God as personally active in history in a redemptive way. Pascal stresses the distance of the deist God of the philosophers from the God of Jesus Christ. He states bluntly that they're closer to one another than either is to Christianity. Sometimes it's assumed that the only alternative to a deistic and impersonal God is a voluntarist one, 
these are the two options in Descartes' meditations, right? You've got the, the evil genius of the beginning part, who's a kind of mirror of late medieval voluntarism, and then you've got the deist god that Descartes arrives at through his two proofs, one early and one later in the meditations. Pascal does not see voluntarism as the only alternative to deism. What else is there? Well, I would suggest if I had more time, I would develop it further. Pascal's response involves a conception of God as practicing an ironic pedagogy, one that leads inquirers into a quest for the good life, as Griswold puts it. Instead of beginning with the crystalline intelligibility of deism, Pascal seems to begin where many postmoderns begin. You could Imagine Pascal asking the question, what kind of a screwed up God would create a universe like the one we inhabit? The most obvious answer might be a voluntarist God, an evil genius, one who's playing tricks on us. But Pascal thinks that our initial look at the universe, if we were to reason to a God, we'd probably reason more readily to a voluntarist God than to a deist one because the evidence is so decidedly mixed, and not just mixed, but messed up. And yet, Pascal thinks there are clues there, clues that followed out can lead us to a deeper and richer conception of God that transcends the voluntarist one, which is to say that in seeming to be a voluntarist God through the evidence of creation, God is actually practicing a kind of irony that invites us to something deeper. Two takeaways from this on what this gives us. I mean, I, I haven't tried here to defend the truth of what Pascal's saying. I'm, I'm trying to lay it out. And I think this is worthwhile for a number of reasons. First of all, it does seem to me to be a different way than almost any of the standard ways of approaching the relationship of faith and reason. And that's worth thinking about. And it also shows the way in which at least one Christian thinker develops analogies to Socratic irony in his account of Christian theology. The other thing is to return to one of my opening observations. We live in an age in which irony is at best the irony of Richard Rorty. And most of what we have as irony today is based upon a kind of cynical, detached skimming that assumes that there's nothing deeper worth knowing or worth pursuing or worth caring about. I think that one of the things that Pascal suggests here is a revival of a kind of irony that doesn't give in to cynicism or despair and that revives a connection between irony and the quest for the good life. Thank you. Yeah, what I tried to do was at various points to list attributes of, of irony, that, that irony operates, first of all, in the gap, as I put it, between what we think we know and what we actually know. It, it, presupposes that there are different levels of understanding and awareness. And that the, the irony is seen when we recognize in ourselves or in others the fact that something we've stated with great confidence is not in fact correspond to the way things are. So that's one part of, of irony. Um, now, irony, the, the Griswold part at the beginning connects irony to two basic options, both of which I think would assume these levels or planes of understanding, that the differences in these levels or planes of understanding that I just mentioned. And one way would be to say that there are people who think they know things, but of course, those of us who actually know know that there isn't anything to be known. So that the irony would be the gap between those who have certitude and those who realize that certitude is impossible. Griswold's other way of, of approaching this is to say that 
irony reposes upon this gap, but the gap is there to initiate us into a quest that at a minimum leaves open the possibility that there are actually things to be known. And so that the initial moment in irony is not necessarily a comment on the knowability or more precisely the unknowability of the universe, but it's a comment on the limitations to our own knowledge, especially the current state of our own knowledge. Um, the, the other element that I was attempting to bring out with respect to irony is that I think ironic pedagogy is about getting, hoping, that the interlocutor engages in a kind of retreat, a step back, that leads him or her to reassess his or her own capacity to pursue, pursue this particular line of inquiry. So that instead of marching forward confident in our abilities and in our knowledge of where we're going and how we're going to get there, irony sort of punctures that confidence and leads us to step back and begin to reassess whether we even know what we're after, whether we're capable of pursuing it, how we ought to pursue it. And I think that is, um, that is something that works. I, th I think you can see that in the dialogues in various places. I think you can also see it in Pascal, in his various attempts to get people to realize that they haven't sought in the way they think they might have if they've rejected this hypothesis, to back up and wonder what method ought I to be using? Maybe I'm debilitated in some way from actually perceiving this truth clearly, and so I ought to think again, pursue another way. So those are various strands in the account of irony. That, that's not a definition, but those are various descriptors I was attempting to give. Well, I think that's Pascal's view of what's happening in the Incarnation. Yeah. And it's, it's also, I think, Pascal's view, although there's, I think Pascal thinks there's actually a, a kind of truth in the, in the self-belittling for the believer, right? So, so at the end of the wager, right, this, this argument which starts out, I mean, perhaps it was written for Pascal's gambling friends who, whose lives were being wild away there rather than in church. And Pascal's saying, all right, here's, here's an account of something that you should be able to understand, that this calculation of an infinitely happy life, sacrificing only this finitely, moderately happy at best life, uh, should work for you. And so it's often taken as a very self-interested and calculative, and it begins that way. Pe that this, this, this kind of argument that, it's, that it's, it's better to wager on God's existence than not. It's better, in fact, to wager and live as if God existed, because we can't know one way or the other for Pascal, than it is to live another way because of the likelihood, the possibility of not just a reward, but an infinite reward. I think William James is quoted as saying that anyone who believed in God on the basis of this wager is the first person God ought to put in hell. Right? That to believe in God for, for these ignoble motives. Right, well, and, and that's probably right if that were all there were to it in the argument, but, but there are at least two other stages that are really important. One of which is that Pascal changes the wager about midway through and starts talking not about wagering stuff that you have, but a wa about wagering all that you are. So that his emphasis is upon, in fact, a, a devotion of one's entire life, and that's why he ends by suggesting that the person start behaving in a certain way, right? But the very ending of this wager conversation with this interlocutor, he, he says, I want you to know that the one who speaks these words to you is, once who was, is one who was once trapped as you are, and who now goes down on his knees before the infinite being to pray for you. Right? And so there as well, it's not just that in the incarnation for Pascal, God who is infinitely higher than all of us belittles or diminishes himself 
to make himself intelligible to us by becoming a human being. It's also that those who adopt this way of life also have to diminish themselves, right, before others. But, but there, it's a diminishment that contains a large grain of truth, right, because what Pascal is saying is, is that my ability to practice this way of life is completely due to an unmerited gift. So it was not something that my abilities garnered for me, so that the, the belittlement there is, is actually reveals a kind of truth. It's not just a faking to move down to a lower level. That's a, that's a long answer to your question. But I, I talk about the, the notion of charity, which is the third order. I mean, the order of the will is the order of charity for Pascal. But th that's right, and, and that's the point at which um, this veiling, which might initially seem to be the result of a possibly vicious, voluntarist God, uh, for whom we are mere playthings, um, is revealed to be the first step in a deeper revelation that th the center of which is God's love for human beings. So I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. By the way, von Balthasar's, um, in, in that study of modern theologians, um, uh, uh, the chapter on Pascal is one of the, I think one of the best things ever written about Pascal. It's, uh, it's quite profound. And if I could, just that opening uh, quote you had from Pascal, the silence of these infinite spaces fills me with dread. I mean, that's, that's sort of what I meant at the end. Pa Pascal sounds an awful lot. And, and if Pascal had a physics, it would be much closer to quantum uh, physics and, and uh, relativity than it would have been to Newtonian physics. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty astonishing the, the kinds of insights that he had that seemed to me to anticipate developments in 20th century science. But also th this sense, you know, to, to quote a, uh, a New Orleans guy, Walker Percy, uh, that sense of being lost in the cosmos, Pascal had a very deep sense of that. And that statement, of course, when you hear statements like that, you wonder, you wonder how to size that up, right? And that, that's probably what worried you in that. And, and I'm not sure in the end, there, there is a, a, um, a way of reading the pensées that wants to say some of these aphorisms are spoken by unbelievers. And that would certainly, if you were going to classify the ones that might be spoken by an unbeliever rather than a believer, that might be the one. Although it, it still seems to me that it, for Pascal, a believer walking around and looking and knowing especially what we know about the cosmos might be filled with both awe and dread. Because uh, I think Pascal also is filled with awe at the cosmos, but it's an awe that is tinged with dread. And that's, that's where his conception of wonder, I think, is different from the Socratic conception, right? Pascal, this wonder is always connected with a kind of fear or anxiety or dread. And if I wanted to stress the ways in which Montaigne and Descartes differ from Socrates, as I did here, that's one of the chief ways in which Pascal's revival of Socrates differs from the original of Socrates. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would say that's the, you're, you're pointing to that section in the Pensee, the man is a, a thinking reed, and then the, the notion that through space the universe grasps me up and destroys me like a speck. Through thought I grasp it. Right, so this sense of the dignity and of the transcendence of reason, even in its own limitations, um, th that seems to me to be uh, a genuinely Socratic theme running through Pascal. Um, whether you can find analogs to that in Montaigne and Descartes, I don't think they're as, as distilled as in those very direct and simple passages in Pascal, but, but it is also the case, I think that's right, I mean, one of the interesting one of the interesting things is to is to wonder whether I mean there, there are lots of things to, to think about here with these three basic options. They're not the only options, perhaps, but they are three sort of stances with respect to Socrates and these French philosophers, with respect to the Socratic question and project. I think that almost everything that um, that Pascal knew about Socrates, he knew from Montaigne, and maybe some other but he didn't read. The only person he really read in a sustained way was Montaigne. Um, read Descartes some, but, 
We don't have a lot of evidence even that he read Augustine in a kind of, in fact, some recent scholars in France are arguing that he really never read the City of God, and maybe he only read parts of the Confessions, right? So he wasn't someone who had a kind of wide and deep reading, but he gets his Socrates in a way through, uh, through Montaigne. It's interesting, I mean, I, I think Pascal sees Descartes and Montaigne as defending the sufficiency of the philosophical life, but defending it against a specific alternative of which Socrates had no notion, right? Um, and, uh, and, you know, one implication might be that after Christianity, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to revive the original Socratic option. I mean, I, I think that if you were to put that question to Pascal, I think that's what he would say. On wretchedness itself, again, there, there are these sort of two parts or two moments. One would be the sort of dignity of thought, right, and nobility and transcendence. And then the other is this silence of these infinite spaces filling me with dread because I don't, I, I, I want, I need to know these things and I can't get to them. Right, so that the wretchedness itself, uh, Pascal always insists that um, uh, for someone to tell us we don't have three eyes does not disconcert us. Right? Well, no, we have two. That's fine. I don't have three. I'm not upset that I don't have three. Uh, but to suddenly go blind might be enormously disconcerting because I recognize the absence of something that I once had and that ought to be there. Pascal thinks the human condition at large is sort of shot through with this sense that we've lost things that we think we ought to have. And for Pascal, this is a, the, an hypothesis, not a proof. That one hypothesis is original sin, right? that, that we in fact, and this is of course, it, an Augustinian moment in Pascal that there's a sort of memory in the human race of a condition that was properly ours but that we've lost. Right? Um, so, so, but even in that for Pascal, the, the greatness transcends it because it's a greatness only man knows he's wretched. So much the worse in one sense, but for Pascal also so much the better because there is this dignity in this kind of self-knowledge. There are a whole host of objections that people have raised. Um, I, I, I mean, my, my thought is that he's most vulnerable, and we're on this question of reason. I think he's most vulnerable, and um, and it all depends, of course, on how you read him, but. Um, you know, Nietzsche has the line that this, this is sort of gruesome faith of Pascal that demands the continual sacrifice, even though he had enormous respect for Pascal. Um, and I, I mean, there are a number of passages in Pascal, once this fine reason of ours was destroyed, it destroyed everything. Now, how do you read those passages? Right, is the question. I mean, I, I read them as uh, in the standard literary mode of the time as hyperbole uh, because I don't think he could consistently say things he says elsewhere if he held that. In other words, if, if he really held a kind of total depravity view uh, of human nature on the basis of sin, then there's no way that, that this passage could make any sense, even retrospectively, I don't think. It would just be a mysterious... I was this and now I'm a Christian. But I think Pascal thinks that there's a story that can be told about how one moves from one to the other, even if one can't reason one's way into it, right? So, but I think those passages where he is uh, so uh, sort of alarmingly dismissive of reason, those are the places where he's most vulnerable. And, and people who work on, some people who work on Pascal whom I've shared my work on Pascal with are more inclined to that view of Pascal. I would say that's probably the most
even of sort of sympathetic commentators, that's the dominant view. Um, so I think he's most vulnerable there. Uh, you know, that there are other places, but I'll stop there. Well, I think that's, um, that's right, uh, that, I mean, it, it, and it's not simply that he's seeming to be both, but that he actually engages both. I mean, there, are, and in this, he's, he's very much mimicking Montaigne, who's constantly working back and forth between the opinions of ordinary folks and the opinions of the philosophers, right? I mean, you, you think, especially in Montaigne, about the early discussion of um, uh, to philosophize is to learn how to die, and the much later discussion, the, the first one really seems strongly to embrace a kind of philosophical therapy in the face of death that frees us from fear, and later on, he's really saying, well, this, this putting, questioning whether that works, and maybe, maybe diversion is the best thing, uh, that, that nature has in fact given us diversion so that we don't think about death. Um, and, and of course, that becomes for Pascal one of the great parts of the pensée on, on diversion. But, but there and in other places, Montaigne is, is moving back and forth between, uh, and perhaps seeming to be both while being neither, the, the ordinary, perspective of the ordinary person and the perspective of the one who claims to be wise. Um, and I think Pascal's doing that too. I mean, we'd have to talk more about what role that plays, but I think with respect to reason, that's right. Just very quickly on the first point you were making, um, the, the deepest irony, of course, about, the, the deepest irony in Pascal's account of the relation between revelation and philosophy is that the the desire or pursuit of intelligibility by the philosopher is in a sense satisfied by the Christian hypothesis, but not in any way that the philosopher initially could have expected or perhaps initially accept, right? I mean, it, it seems to me that, that the bafflement that Pascal is suggesting the philosopher ought to feel in the face of the Christian is something that the philosopher is going to unsettle the philosopher in a very deep way. Uh, and, and so in that, if the philosopher were to be moved to see the Christian hypothesis as the answer to the quest for the intelligibility of the whole, it's in quite different terms and by quite different means than the philosopher had initially set out on his quest using. I think there are lots of interesting points. I mean, the, all those texts in Nietzsche are very interesting, and there are a lot more that are very interesting. And, um, but but I, I, I mean, I've taught many of those texts. I don't have a, and maybe it's not possible to have one in the end, but I don't have a settled view uh, on uh, Nietzsche. Although, I, I mean, in teaching undergraduates, um, I, I find that Pascal and Nietzsche coming at this from quite different perspectives do help students to, I mean, maybe in the end that's right, maybe Nietzsche is, I mean, I, I, I'm not yet at the point where I can't take the reading of Nietzsche seriously, but, but maybe it's right that in the end he doesn't have anything serious to say to us about these questions. Maybe that's, that's right. I think for students reading these two authors and reading them in some sense together, or reading Kierkegaard and Nietzsche together to see First of all, the way in which they frame these questions, and this, and and at least, you know, that, that passage you mentioned, the, the the madman, the character in the gay science announcing the death of God, having come too early, right? Because no one knows what he's saying. Um, that there is a seriousness about the ramifications of whether God exists or not, that Nietzsche, in those passages and in many others, uh, captures, and. I think our, my students at least, but whether they're at Boston College or at Baylor, and they're quite different types of students at those two schools, um, they're, they're um, whether they're believers or not, often have not thought about the question with that degree of seriousness and about the ramifications. And I think Pascal and Nietzsche are two thinkers who do, who know that um, everything or just short of everything is at stake in the answer to those questions.
Well, that, that's my hypothesis for what he would have said about the history of modern philosophy. But, but I think he saw it there. Actually, the despair comes before the presumption because Montaigne predates Descartes. Uh, but, but that's how he sees the two of them. I mean, all three of them are coming, um, well, um, Montaigne and Pascal are certainly coming much more directly out of the humanist rhetorical tradition of early modern Europe than either of them out of scholasticism, right? So in terms of style, they're quite different. Pascal shares with Descartes a, the serious study of mathematics. Um, so, I mean, there, there are certainly places where Pascal thinks that, that the project of natural theology which is certainly part of the scholastic tradition, is, as I pointed out at one point early on, a, a sort of bold, reckless, and misleading attempt to think that God is, is made evident in nature in the way that these proofs assume. Now, I think that it's pretty clear that Pascal considers the gravest offender to be Descartes, uh, not Aquinas, for example. Um, but, but I think Aquinas comes under, and Scotus and others come under that, uh, that rejection of natural theology. Uh, and um, you know, there are other places where he quotes the particular teachings of Aquinas approvingly. Uh, Pascal does. Uh, you know, one of the things is that Pascal's writing in the Pensee for an audience that exists after the critique of Aristotle and with the advent of multiple modern scientific views, he's also writing for unbelievers. Um, Aquinas' audience, and that of many early scholastics at least, is not just believers, but people who join religious orders, uh, Dominicans, Franciscans, and others. So there's there are differences that need to be taken into account there, but, but I think the place where there's the most direct contact and criticism would be on the question of natural theology, this question of whether reason by observing nature can reach the existence of God. And, and on that, Pascal's quite skeptical and not just skeptical, but critical of the implications of it. Difficult to discern, right? And, but, but there are certain principles that Pascal has here that are not difficult to articulate. Um, one is that no one's moved to authentic faith apart from grace, which is a gift. Right? That, that's why I think that the, the, the ironic, that's another way in which the ironic element is there, right? Because Pascal thinks that you could look at all of this and say, it makes a kind of sense, right? But not be moved, the only way you could actually adopt it you couldn't be moved to it by a, a set of rational arguments because the hypothesis itself of original sin and the incarnation are not, according to the revelation itself, are not deliverances of reason. Right? So, so grace would be operative there. I, I think that, here's where it gets tricky. I think after the fact, after one has made the conversion and starts to write the Augustinian confessions of one's life. Looking back, Augustine says, oh, I now believe that grace was working here and here, right? I mean, he leaves Carthage because he's got these obnoxious students who keep interrupting classes and won't pay to go to Rome. And, and he says, you know, you addressing God, we're moving there, moving there for quite a different reason, right? So, um, and, and obviously there are things going on on different planes there that can either fit together or not, and different levels and types of causality that can be operative for Augustine and for Pascal, um, is it, it would be hard, the way Pascal construes the, the ever more refined sense of the contradictions of the human condition, is that, that the dread increases <laughs> as you focus on these things more and more, because each attempt to resolve them doesn't work. Right? And so what you get is an, is an ever-increasing sense of the, the impossibility of unra the seeming impossibility of unraveling the knot, right? as he puts it, because God hit it so high or rather so low. Um, it would be hard to see that 
from the perspective of the unbeliever as a grace. Right? Although, you could say that it is a, a, a greater sense uh, or a greater honesty about, the, about one's own condition. Right? So you could call it a grace in that sense, but you wouldn't necessarily call it a divine grace. Um, so could that be the result of grace? I think Pascal thinks certainly it could be the result of God moving someone to a greater apprehension of this, which leads to a greater desire for the truth and then keeps that person seeking. That's, that's uh, certainly possible, and it's certainly possible that Pascal would see the, um, the failure to give in to despair, to put it negatively, as a grace. Because the temptation to despair is enormous. Or the temptation to rest in a kind of false certitude, which is just the flip side of despair for Pascal. Thank mm-hmm. you.